Anyway, would you like to talk about the WWE evil? Yeah, it was actually uh, an interesting episode this week. And when, I say this episode. week, every time we talk about it and say this week, it's the whole season's on Peacock right now. Uh, but it, they're on USA Network on Tuesday nights now. And it's, by the way, we didn't, there was nothing on NXT that was worth two shits to talk about this week. So instead we went to just straight to evil. And and you got the raw review on the drive through this week, folks. So what more do you want? For your money. But the evil this week was on Hulk Hogan. A name synonymous with evil. But this was this was not how he saved pro wrestling as its first ever superhero, but this was how he saved pro wrestling again as its first ever supervillain. He invented all this stuff, according to the program. Is that what you got out of it, Brian? He came up with all this shit. Being mean and betraying people he lies about everything i didn't think this was too over the top for him the only thing i'll say is when one of the talking heads tried to present it like this is what made heels cool i would answer well you know steve austin you know was yeah. actually there too so it wasn't just hollywood hogan making heels cool but- well wait a minute but he Heels were cool when Ric Flair, the previous decade, was the world champion. Heels were cool when superstar Billy Graham was the heel we just talked about a little while ago on the show in New York, and he was the champion. Heels were cool in the 60s when it was Bruiser and Crusher, right? Because they pretty much got turned because they were invincible, never sold anything, and never did a job. So they became the road warriors of the 60s. So it's not... I mean, I'm not going to start tearing down everything that Hogan did in this equation of the Hollywood Hulk Hogan, WCW heel, NWO era. But again, for the mass audience, the mass consumption that they do these shows for, they simplify things down to the point where you would think that no one had ever, no ultra babyface had ever turned heel and betrayed the fans before no one had ever thought of such a dastardly thing and i know for hogan this was not exaggerated much and i liked a few of the sideways shots that they did nash actually uh, we'll get to that in a second but nash actually telling what hogan was really like to work with Uh, So they got some shots in there, but they had to, obviously, to have Hogan's participation. They had to make it mostly complimentary and genuflect toward him as his, you know, position in the wrestling pantheon deserves, right? Right. They left off his real heel turn, which was on a tape in Bubba the Love Sponge's bedroom. (laughs) Um, No mention of that. The clips that they, when they started out telling the story of Hogan's, you know, superhero-dom and his rise, and uh, the publicity that he did get in the 80s was insane. Johnny Carson and Mike Douglas and every talk show and every sports show, and especially leading up to WrestleMania. And when you think about it, this was another of Vince Jr.'s reversals of previous you know uh, maybe his father's you know uh, uh, rulings or just previous rules of thumb in wrestling they didn't care what publicity they got as long as it was publicity we've talked about that if it wasn't favorable publicity in the territory days the promoters didn't want it they were doing business already they didn't want the publicity of hey this is all fake and phony and predetermined and you're a goofy sucker if you go there, because that's what a lot of newspapers or TV stations, that's the direction they wanted to take. I've talked about seeing Christine Jarrett personally throw the WHAS news crew out of the Louisville Gardens because the stuff they said about her fans and her business the previous time. And she'd say, we got 3,500 people in there. We don't need your kind of publicity. But Vince wasn't scared about people telling people wrestling was a work he was going to do it anyway and he just wanted to book people everywhere but you know hogan never did that it wasn't like there was ever 
any of the wrestlers, they weren't book places to talk about wrestling not being on the up and up. He was the only one who did it in interviews. Vince. Well, no, but 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 Vince got him. He didn't care. He just wanted him out there. They could take care of themselves. They didn't have to say it. But, you know, but that's a, it just opened up where he was getting his people in any type of media situation he could just for publicity and just to get the names and the faces and the idea out. He he wasn't, I mean, they would turn up on anything, especially in the eighties. It was, they, they weren't making a secret of what was going on anymore. As far as, you know, this, uh, the, the wrestling promotion was always in all those cities and always drawing those crowds. But the papers and the TV stations didn't pay any attention to it. A lot of times when they did, they'd get kicked out because they'd be uncomplimentary. But now all of a sudden it's like, oh, book my guys. But he was on everything. Um, and it helped that he looked like that. You know, that's one thing, our, our debate that we had earlier. Dusty would have got over with charm and charisma, but he didn't look like that in an 8 by 10 right? So if you're the Tonight Show booker, do you want this guy you've never heard of or this guy you've never heard of, but one of them looks better than the other one? Well, the other thing, too, is Hogan knew how to turn on the charm for a mainstream audience better than yeah. almost anyone in wrestling history. And he used that to very good uh, advantage. Did you see who made a guest appearance? In a one, maybe 1 1.2 second clip when they were showing some WCW highlights from 1993. Oh, I, I think I know exactly what you're talking about because I said, oh, there he is. Was it Jim Cornette and Heavenly Bodies? Yes. Apropos <laughs> of absolutely nothing, when they're just saying the lay of the land of WCW in 93, there was a one and a half second clip of the angle we did when Watts had us come in for Super Bowl and the bodies in the Midnight Express had the TV match. Give them credit. It's stupid as it is. They're talking about right when Bischoff got control and they went to right when he was talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Why else would they pull up that clip of all the clips? I, I, it, it, it happened in 1993. I don't, you know, that's the only connection that I can see that that, but anyway. So Bischoff's story is he pitched Hogan to turn heel, but Hogan hated the idea, and that's what we've always heard also. But basically, they didn't come out and say this, but when Hall and Nash started getting over as the invaders, the outsiders, then all of a sudden, Hogan liked it better. And he admitted that he knew he had to reinvent himself because it had been the same thing for, at that point, what, 13 years. Uh, but then as soon as he decides in this well, context, this program, go ahead. Let me stop you there. It wasn't the same thing. And I think this is something people miss. Hulk Hogan was like one thing up until 86, 87. And then he became like a cartoon version of that Hulk Hogan. True. It went more and more over the top. Yeah. Hogan in the AWA into the early years of Hulkamania and the WWF as people were meeting him all around the country and he was a big star. That was one thing, and then he just became too... For a lot of kids like me, there was a reason we turned against him. There's a reason we liked The Ultimate Warrior more. Hogan just started getting more and more cartoony. Hokey? Hokey. Hokey Hogan? Hokey, <laughs> Hokey Hogan. That's, well, that's it's what it was, and then it, it, the TBS tried to change WCW to chase Vince, and the wrestling fans got no alternative to cartoon, you know, ice cream bar land. And they started turning against everything in the early nineties. But anyway, so if, if Hogan admits he had to reinvent himself, but then from that point forward, the, the tone of the special is that he had to save pro wrestling by switching heel, uh, you know, uh, and he saved it again. And then everybody is, I, I wrote, everybody verbally fellates Hogan like he invented being a heel wrestler. <laughs> Dr. Phil is back. Uh, uh, why is Dr. Phil on this program? For a paycheck? I mean, w let's do a fucking biography of Dr. Of, of Dr. Phil, of Hulk Hogan. The first person we got to get is Dr. Phil. I don't, and he was on, who else was he on? Uh, no, I don't know what the fuck's going on. Dr. Oprah Winfrey? Phil. I don't know. <laughs> no, he was on another one of these evil specials. Anyway, they must have got comments on multiple people. Anyway, the Slipknot guy. 
a guy from Slipknot um, actually said the quote, there was a virus in wrestling. It's like the heels were cool, which was exactly where they went wrong and wouldn't, it, it was, we're talking about the NWO's impact on WCW, where they made all of the WCW guys look like clueless putzes and made the NWO heels look cool to where that they lost their own fucking company. And all the WCW fans were like, what the fuck? Yeah, anyway. Bruce Pritchard is so careful not to say anything inflammatory to anyone living or dead. It's amazing. He can... He can say a, a make a flat statement, and it will take neither person's side in an issue where there's only two sides. Beyond not being able to listen to him because he says the most boring stuff in the slowest, most monotone manner. Beyond that, I can't stop looking at his neck. It's like it's oh now to like come on five times the size and hey. It's just disgusting. It, you know, over thirty five percent of the men in America will suffer at some point or another, from male-expanding neck. So don't be yeah. so frivolous. And over 40% will suffer from watching TV that Bruce Pritchard had a part of. No, not that many people will watch TV. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Good so, point. <laughs> in 1996, they say on this special, <laughs> this was a quote, WCW was dominating the WWF in the ratings, thanks to Hulk Hogan. I bet you at that point, Hall and Nash and a few other people down there were uh, probably pissed. Um, yeah, and they came as close as possible as just saying he noticed that Nash and Hall were getting over big yes. time. And he didn't want it to be Sting. He said, make it me. It has to be yeah. me. It can't be Sting. It must be me. And honestly, Sting couldn't have done it anyway. The, I asked Sting when Sting was in the main event mafia in TNA. And he was a baby face in the top heel group because of some fantasy that Shitstain had dreamed of after dinner at Taco fucking Tico. And I asked him, I said, Sting, you're, you're a heel. Well, ex talk to Vince. He'll explain it to you why I'm a baby face, but I'm in the heel group. I said, I have, and he tried, and it didn't work. So now you're beating the baby faces without cheating. And you're in the heel groups. Haven't you ever wanted to be a heel just to have fun like that? No. That was his answer. No. Never wanted to be a heel. So he wouldn't have been able to do it anyway. And honestly, I think Sting is another person who either because of the religion or just the presentation has come to think that he would be betraying the, the little children. The little, the little children if he became a heel. But anyway. That was Cody's excuse too, wasn't it? I get, you know, somebody ought to ask the children how they feel about these <laughs> children. Probably, yeah, fuck him. I don't like him anyway. Turn him heel. So Hogan then demanded creative control. And Booker T's comment is, well, and that opened up a whole can of worms. Then Hogan's quote was, their egos all got out of control when I got creative control. That's the funniest <laughs> line of the whole and thing. Then, and then Kevin Nash says, so the golden one would walk in at 5.15 on an 8 o'clock show and say, well, that doesn't work for me, brother, and not have any other idea. Do you have an idea? No, it just doesn't work for me. Okay, dude, we'll work around you. So that was... <laughs> then Hogan blames the TBS management for taking control away from Eric Bischoff because Hogan and Bischoff are still close. Apparently Hogan and Harvey Schiller or who is the other fellow of, you know, uh, Francis Ford Kippola or all the other people, they're not still close, but he still likes Bischoff. So it wasn't Bischoff's fault. Basically, they sent Shitstain and Bischoff home at one point or another. Bischoff says that Shitstain, which this is true, was able to convince, and he, quoted, he was quoted as saying this, was able to convince the TBS administration that he was the architect of the Attitude Era. And that's, and that's been publicly known for a while because the, the suits, the higher-ups, the administration in Turner Broadcasting had no idea how the WWE worked. 
and how the office was structured or anything. So when they hear they have a chance to hire the head writer, they thought they were getting the whole ball of wax. And that's how that shit stain was able to con himself into that fucking job. So then they had a situation there where everybody hated everybody else. And a bunch of people had pull over other shit. So then they go to shit stain for comments. And the first words out of his mouth were setting up his excuse. Well, I went in there and I had a target on my back the very first day. That sounds more like Franklin Delano Roosevelt, doesn't it? And I didn't say bro. Bro, I had a target on my back the very first day. I told Eleanor. I said, the only thing we have to fear is my booking itself. So then we've got Bischoff and Shitstein and Hogan going back and forth, all three bickering. <laughs> In, in separate locations about whose fault it was. But I just still find it amazing that no matter who it is that's involved and no matter what their background or their viewpoint about wrestling or their politics or their, their race, creed, color, or national origin, everybody who's ever worked with shit stain thinks he was the fucking problem and that he's an idiot. So that's, we got that going for us. So then they go through the, uh, and this is, Brian, as a person who might not have been born 25 years ago and is just watching this program, did you understand everything that happened when they covered the whole Hogan bash at the beach, Jeff Jarrett lay down, screw job, bullshit, work shoot, gaga that got people sued? You understood everything from watching this program, didn't you? I understood everything because I knew the bigger story, yeah. so I knew what to look for, but... It was probably confusing for people who had no idea what was going on throughout the whole thing. All of a sudden, yes. it was this. And and again, it just it looked fake and it looked phony, which it did at the time. But they talked about that, and the the, the then they basically spotlighted shit stain on the clip when he was in there. He was trying to be. He had gone to a new company that he had basically pulled the wool over their eyes and convinced them that he was responsible for what had happened in the WWF. Then, it, because the WWF would never think of allowing him on television as a performer or character, he's got carte blanche to do that. So there is shit stain trying to be the center of attention, the star of his show, exposing the business for his own masturbatory Shakespeare fantasies and getting them sued by Hulk fucking Hogan. So, <laughs> but uh, this show, I don't think was fair because it made it seem like that Russo killed WCW by killing Hogan off. When in actuality, he actually did so much more damage to everybody else and so many more programs and so many more careers and so much more programming. And the industry as a whole. And the industry as a whole that anything that he did to Hogan, really, he didn't do anything bad to Hogan because Hogan ended up suing and ended up actually being instrumental in getting Russo moved out of the way so that they could limp on for another, what, couple of years until they finally went out of business. Can you imagine that Harvey Schiller? Hey, Hulk Hogan's on line one. Hulk, sir, how are you? They did what? On pay-per-view? <laughs> and then he said, what? On pay-per-view? <laughs> and and they you slandered you? They slandered you? The guy with creative control and we've been paying millions of dollars a year to? By the time he called them back, Russo was sent home. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and you know, now the... Remember when Paul was uh, Paul Heyman was being flirted with with the idea of coming to TNA, right? And he he made headlines with the first thing he said was he'd fire everybody over forty. Well, now shit stains apparently saying that's the first thing that he said, and actually I believe he probably did because he was Paul had good intentions in TNA. Uh, shit stain walking into WCW saying I'll fire everybody over 40 he was a complete idiot and committing career suicide because he was so full of himself and knew that the 
brass thought he was important. But can you imagine coming in having no relationship whatsoever with the biggest star in the company, and the first thing you do is group him in with the people that you would fire if you had the opportunity? If that were true, and he walked in and said, I'm going to fire everyone over the age of 40, just think about who's sitting there. Hogan. Macho Man. Flair. Ric Flair. Roddy Piper. Piper. I mean, it's ridiculous. How old was Brett? Brett was getting up. I mean, Brett wasn't a young guy anymore. He's probably close to 40. All these guys were probably, no, he, it's like he all was, Japan was, women. They're going to be forced out at the age of 26. So then they ended up, the uh, the program with covering the Rock Hogan match where... Basically, The Rock in Toronto turned him back babyface, but it was because the people demanded it and the triumphant return of the red and yellow. But, should have uh, stayed in the black. That was the other big mistake, I thought. They should have kept him in the black as a babyface for a while. They went right. As soon as he turned babyface, he switched his colors. That was silly. Well, yeah, remember, and Vince insisted he have the shit flown to him because Vince always wanted his creation back. He didn't like the bizarro world Hogan. He didn't like the dark Hogan. He liked the, the colorful Hogan, the Hogan that walked toward the light. And as pork chop cash once said, once seen the light can't walk in the dark. That was when he switched babyface. And as mad boy, as mad dog Boyd said, <laughs> I'm so bad. I eat Papa. Now what this has to do with Hulk Hogan, that's anyone's guess. But I don't know. I mean, but, overall, know, I thought it was better than the uh, what was the previous one we watched, the Flair one. As a as a special, I thought it was better than the Flair one. But again, it was just a really rosy picture of Hogan. I don't think seen as a really good narrator. But it's kind of what you expect. I mean, they're not going to really dive deep into anything. And for did what you it see wa what, what? Go ahead. I was just. Did you see what's next week? No. What's next week? Well, this is WWE evil. So we're talking about the greatest heels in the history of the game, right? We've seen Hulk Hogan. We've seen Ric Flair. We've seen Randy Orton. What other top he unforgettable heel in the McMahon empire are you, are, have we not heard from yet or heard about? Richard Belzer? <laughs> Stephanie McMahon. Oh, come on. Really? <laughs> I swear to God, that's what I saw on the listing. Don't blame me. Blame TV Guide. This should be some interesting revisionist history. You know, we have to watch this one. Well, and here's another thing. Now you're talking about a heel that never appeared on any house shows and never wrestled or worked anywhere else besides one company and only appeared on television on one of the shows for that company. You could argue she's the first great modern heel. No house show appearances. <laughs> <laughs> Just appears on TV randomly. Never gets her heat taken away. Yes, constantly emasculates all the stars. At uh, I, Again, you know, I say that somebody, if they had, at, at the right time, if somebody had just picked Stephanie McMahon up and given her a big goddamn Killer Carl Cox brain buster, they'd have been the biggest baby face in the history of the wrestling business. Because she had some heat built up that she was annoying because nobody could ever get over on her verbally or physically. That was one of the saddest things, I think, about the last appearances of Dusty Rhodes on TV. And it's one of the few times I thought they actually kind of were getting things right with Cody years before Stardust, when they had Cody and Dustin with Dusty, and Dusty, reading the room, picks up his hand and puts it in Stephanie's face, and that was the last time Dusty really was able to do anything on his own ever again on WWE TV. That's what happened. He tried to act the way a babyface would. Yeah. As opposed to standing there and taking it. That's what the writers would have you do. Because they would say, well, she's your boss, so you have to take it. And you have no alternative. But they don't understand that in the world of wrestling, the alternative that the babyface has is to punch the fucking bitch in the face. Either that or don't put her in front of the babyface, mouthing off and talking down to him. Because you cannot put a baby face in a position to be emasculated or inoculated or any of those other ladies, especially by a woman, that you, the fans are living vicariously through the baby face. And in the movies and the TV shows and the fantasies that they would have in their head, whether boss, whether man, woman, child, animal, vegetable, or mineral, 
they want to punt that fucking person in the fucking spleen. And obviously, you can't, especially in today's modern-day environment, you can't have the baby face haul off and punch Stephanie in the face, which is why she should have never been put in a position where she was getting something over on the people that could not retaliate. Because, it, again, it emasculates them and makes them ineffective. Even if somebody had brought in a girl. Did, did we ever see, did they ever bring in a girl to tackle Stephanie and whip her ass? Because girls can still fight, right? Well, Rhonda was the one who got her at WrestleMania, remember? Okay, after so after how many years of her doing that, and that's why the Ronda Rousey debut was a big deal. Here comes Ronda, finally gives her a taste of her own medicine. But she had backed down or backed up all those guys, all those top stars, and the people do not want to think about, well, he can't get even because he can't hit a woman on television or whatever. The people want to think that their heroes are not going to put up with that fucking talk from anybody. So don't put them in that position. That's the fucking root of the matter. But you know what position you could be in, Brian? No, I don't know. You could have holes in your lawn, bare spots. Bare spots in the lawn. And that requires serious fucking addressing because it could spread from there and then all you've got is a big yard full of dirt. And folks, every Sunday, you walk out on Sunday afternoon, you look at your lawn, and you think, boy, that looks like shit. And you know, you try to do something good about it, but did you know, Brian, that traditional lawn care lays down 90 million pounds of pesticides each year right into our ground, right into the, the water that we drink and the earth that we grow our food in? And I know you grow half of your family's food right there in your backyard. What kind of pesticides are you putting on your yard? You could be poisoning the little ones. No wonder they've all got fucking little arms growing out their necks and what? they've got that conjoined twin on their forehead. Oh, will you the stop it? Everyone there. here is healthy. We don't worry about pesticides on our lawn or anything else because A, Stephen P. New, plus B, we have another option for our lawn. Well, we did. I'll tell you another thing. You ought to keep track of those kids because they're out there. You, you don't know. They might be drinking out of the septic tank. You might need a no. new septic tank. Something's going on with those children. But what, folks, you might not have been thinking about the lawn all winter, but it's time to get started. Spring will come eventually for many of us here in this country. And you don't have to do a lot of work to get the lawn green and healthy again so you can look at it on Sunday afternoons because all you got to do is Get Sunday Lawn. Go to GetSunday.com. Sunday can help you grow a beautiful lawn without the guesswork or the nasty chemicals. They have a custom plan, including fertilizer and all the other stuff that you need to easily care for your lawn. They've got no nasty chemicals that are going to turn your kids orange and, and make them look like mutants from Mars as they graze on the lawn like kids are known to do. Do your kids eat a lot of grass, Brian? My kids don't graze on the lawn. But if well, they did, of because of Sunday lawn, it would be, I don't want to encourage anyone eating it. They don't graze on the lawn. Well, but if you do want to eat this stuff, it's Sunday lawn, no. they have a green. It's like seaweed, iron, and molasses. Molasses is good. My mother always used to talk about how slow it was in January. But iron, seaweed, molasses, all these things are so... If you want your kids to be able to graze out on the lawn or your pets, you can feel good about that. No bad chemicals. All you got to do is visit GetSunday.com, and that's Sunday, S-U-N-D-A-Y, like Sunday. GetSunday.com, put in your address. Their lawn analysis tool does the rest. That guy, I don't know why they call him a tool. He's not that bad. He's a nice guy, but he, he works on the lawn analysis, and they... Zero in on your yard with a satellite and use soil and climate data to create a personal nutrient plan delivered to your door when you need it. And I've had some people say, well, how are they going to figure out what I like to eat and how much is nutri nutritious for me from the soil and climate data? It's not your personal, personal nutrient plan. It's the personal nutrient plan for your yard. You're not... Well, yeah, I guess you could eat this stuff. It's seaweed, iron, and molasses. Don't eat it. But, but, but spray it on your yard, though. That's preferable. 
At least that way, if you are going to eat any of this, use ranch dressing or some no, kind of cheese whiz. Don't eat it. You will attach the ready-to-use pouch that you will receive from Get Sunday to a garden hose and just spray. Just spray that thing. Just fucking, just looking like you're just an old faithful. Just spray it all around. It takes less than 15 minutes, and your lawn will be green without the nasty treacherous, poisonous chemicals that could create situations where mutants would be roaming your neighborhood eating people's poodles. You don't want that. And right now, Sunday is offering our listeners 20% off full season plans. Depends on how big your yard is. Well, I'm still talking to them about my place because I can't get a, a hose to a lot of my area without significant extensions but for you folks who have manageable yards this is great full season plan started just 129 dollars you can get 20 percent off at checkout when you go to get sunday.com slash jce 20 percent off your custom plan at get sunday.com slash jce who knows what you're putting on your yard right now this stuff tailored to it the exact data for whether you're in Oregon or Ohio or whatever the case. And again, it's a personal nutrient plan for your yard. One guy thought you were going to have to eat the stuff they delivered and go take a shit out on your yard. That's the way it was delivered. I said, no, you're eliminating the middleman here. You don't have to eat the personal nutrient plan. You spray it out in the yard and then the grass will be good enough to eat. And then you'll save money on, on your greens and your vegetables. And you got to get roughage. Bluegrass has a lot of roughage, so you'll know when you when, if you have bluegrass, you're you're gonna and and a nice thousand island with bluegrass is what you're gonna want to go for. Some of the crab grass, it just depends. You may have to use out of mushroom gravy. Get Sunday.com slash JCE twenty percent off at checkout. 